Thank you so much, Emma, Kate, worship team, for leading us today. Uh, So turn to the person next to you and say as fast as you can, Summer Song Sermon Series. Go! (laughs) Woo, that's a great sound. I like that. That sounded great. Oh, we're done. I mean, dismiss us. (laughs) Uh, Whenever there's something that's like a tongue twister, my wife will turn to me and say, say that as fast as you can, three times in a row, and I usually can't. Uh, But hey, I'm so thankful, like uh, Missy was saying, it's so cool to see students like Kate and young adults like Emma coming and lead us. In fact, one of the things I failed to mention last week that some of you know about is we shifted our youth ministry schedule. So we have high schoolers in the room both hours. Now that's sometimes the case anyway, but normally our small groups in just this hour was all students and then we had no small groups the second hour. Well now we have middle school groups both hours. But high schoolers are in here with us. And so high schoolers, I'm glad you're in here with us. And I've thought of you about this series because the one thing I've noticed, and I hope I'm not alone in the room, but I don't know what age it happened. I actually think I was in my 30s when it happened. But I cannot learn lyrics anymore. They just, I'm like, what did that just say? I don't even know. I'll hum it, but I can't say the words. I can't, it used to be, and I, and I know that when my kids were students, they could hear a song once or twice, and then they're like, blah, 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 and they're saying all the words like really fast. I'm like, how do you do that? I think the memory banks get a little full. Uh, I, can, I can sing a song to you from the 80s or the 90s or you know, old hymn that I learned when I was younger. Uh, but it's really, really hard for me to pick up on lyrics. <clears throat> but one of the reasons that we're doing this series, it's one that I wanted to do for a while Uh, We have so many songs that we sing over and over that you've probably heard throughout your lives. And there's something unique about music. In its own way, it it preaches to us. Sometimes a lyric and with the music that goes with it can hit us in a way that nothing else can. Uh, One of the favorite quotes I've ever heard about music is it's been said that music is the language of the soul. Well, I found a quote from someone by the name of L. R. Nas that expands upon that. It says, music speaks the language of the soul, penetrating into the past and resonating into the future, unearthing pain and tenderness and sorrow and joy, reminding us of our infinite fragility and extraordinary strength, Reigniting our dreams and passions once again to remind us of who we are meant to be. I like that. It's a nice quote. It's such a good reminder of the power of music in our lives. In fact, this may sound like a weird thing, but in my life, I tend to be like, if I got time to listen to something, I want to listen to something that will sort of check the box of something I need to get done. So I'll end up thinking, I want to learn more about this As a minister, so I'll find podcasts on those topics. And then if I'm uh, doing exercise or doing lawn work or I'm having a long drive, I'll throw that on. But it hit me at different points last year that those times when I'm like, you know, I can't even really fiddle around to figure out which audio book or podcast I was going to listen to. I'll just throw some music on. And it hit me that, man, I've not been listening to a lot of music And it really hit me in a very good, powerful way. I literally had, as one of my New Year's resolutions for 2024, just simply to listen to more music. Just, you know, I know you're trying to be productive, Bill, and listen to podcasts, check off your book list. But sometimes you just got to listen to this awesome thing that we call music that speaks to our soul in ways that maybe a spoken word can't. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I I think I know the answer to it probably already. And this goes for everybody in the room, maybe especially if you're already a believer in Christ. I know in this room, we have a wide, diverse spiritual spectrum. You know, I love that every week we have some in the room that maybe just curious or, hey, I'm going to go to church. This seems like a cool place to come. Or or maybe someone strongly urged you to come against your will. That's okay, too. Uh, and, and But you're not sure what you believe yet. And then also on the far end of the other end of the spectrum, we have people who have been following Jesus for decades. And all of us are still learners. All of us are still figuring things out. And God is still writing our stories. The one thing I've come to learn 
is that most people can answer this question yes, no matter if they're not a believer yet or they've been a believer a long time. And the question is this. Have you ever gone through something that where it, when it rains, it pours? When it rains, it pours. It's like, oh, it ain't just one thing. It's a second thing and a third thing and a fourth thing. And they just stack on the top of one another, one after another, after another, after another. And you stop and you say, okay, Lord, please help me understand what is happening. Why is all of this happening? Maybe I can withstand one of these seven things or four things or 20 things or 12 things. But it just seems like wave after wave after wave of something negative is going on in my life. Can you relate to that, guys? And it, it, whether you've been following Jesus for decades or you haven't begun to follow him yet, most of us can say, I get that. You can be an atheist and you still sometimes say, why, God? Why, God, is this happening? Well, there was a person I want to introduce you to by the name of Horatio Spafford who could certainly say he knows what that's like. He can relate to this too. And in the midst of probably one of the worst times in his life, he penned the words to a song that you probably know somewhat well, maybe very well. And the actual name of the song is, It Is Well. I want to read to you the backstory of this hymn. And I'm reading, uh, it's written by a guy named Lloyd Newell. And he penned it, he wrote it as an introduction to a choral arrangement of this hymn that his church was doing. But it very succinctly and concisely tells the story. So I want to read it for you. It begins by saying, Life can be so unpredictable. Joys and sorrows, beautiful blessings and distressing difficulties can come unexpectedly. Our life's dreams and plans can change in an instant. We all know this to be true. So how can we find peace amid such turbulence? Horatio Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune, a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, Horatio Spafford lost his beloved four-year-old son to scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved Alone, what should I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where their shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind. And he wrote them down, and they have since become lyrics that we sing today. He penned the words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. 
My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Each week we're together this summer. We will throw alongside the song that we're looking at a scripture that was part of the inspiration of the lyrics written for the song that we sang. And one of the most closest resembling passages of scripture to It Is Well, written by Horatio Spafford, was a song written thousands of years ago that's right there in our Bibles, the 42nd Psalm, which Psalm is actually a song. And here's how it reads, starting in verse 1. It says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And then the psalmist closes once again with this chorus. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. I love that last verse. I like the word again there. For those who are followers of Jesus in this room, and maybe you've been doing it a long time, when you suddenly find yourself in a situation where that question is spinning in your mind, like, God, where are you? God, why is this happening? Why am I enduring this? Why is there so much turmoil? Why is there wave after wave after wave of grief, sadness, hardship that I'm enduring right now? And his answer to that in the refrain, after he asked the question, why are you downcast, O oh, my soul, is hoping God, for I shall again praise him. And it might be for just a moment that praise cannot rise out of your depths of your soul onto your lips and out. But again, it will happen. Hang on to the hope that you have in God because you will praise again. And all of this reminds me of one of my favorite promises in all of the Bible. And it's also in the Psalms. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Now, here's the thing that I think is so subtle about it is well with my soul and about Psalm 42. As you think about the thing that anchors the person going through grief, going through stress after stress, anxiety after anxiety, fear after fear, hardship after hardship, the thing that Horatio Spafford wrote throughout the verses of It Is Well With My Soul, and we also find it in the refrain of Psalm 42, is a good old theological word called salvation. That's the thing. That's the thing that keeps being reminded over and over to us by Horatio Spafford as he was writing his lyrics 
It's like, man, you just lost so much in your life. He had lost so much, so much tragedy, so much grief. And the reason he could say it is well with his soul is because he also could say, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not a part of it, but all of it has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord on my soul. What brought his soul and his spirit and his worship and his life back to rise above all that he was enduring tragically in his life was the fact that he had this great salvation that he could cling to no matter what. And that is why I say this to us today. In the darkest times of my life, God is still God. God is still good. And nothing can take away the salvation he gives. Nothing can take it away. There's a lot of things that we're going to endure in this life. In fact, I made a list in case you're not depressed enough yet this morning. I thought I'd make a little list for us. And in true preacher fashion, they all start with the letter D. Death, disease, doubt, and disobedience. I hate those things. (laughs) Don't you? Things that we were never meant to really endure and experience when God created the first man and first woman and placed them in the garden Before sin entered the world, these weren't things that we had to deal with. And now all human beings will experience this in some way. Death of loved ones. Disease. And I've been talking to people that have been enduring some of the... There's some diseases out there that just I hate more than others. What they do to the mind. What they do to the body. Doubts that will come flooding in and sometimes in unexpected ways, especially when you are going through something really difficult, something that makes no sense. I find that we're good if we can kind of connect dots and explain things, right? We're following Jesus and we love God, but if we can find like, well, that's why God let that happen, I can connect the dot there. But if you live long enough, and if you know enough people in your life, you're going to at some point If it's not directly in your own life, it's going to be directly in someone's life you care about. Something will happen. You're like, now that is senseless. There is. I cannot find that silver lining right now. I cannot write out the blessing in the midst of whatever that is. That happens sometimes. And when that happens, the doubts will show up. And you'll begin to question And you will question like even the psalmist did. Why so downcast, oh, my soul? Or as the psalmist says, where is your God? (laughs) That's normal to have those doubts. And then disobedience, throw that one in there because I think this one gets underestimated. Sometimes the hardest moments in my own life is when something about my past kind of bubbles up to the surface. Or my own pride. Or my own wrong choices. Or my own reactions. Or those own times when I didn't love like Jesus loves. I didn't do things his way and I did it my way instead. And those moments can put us in a bad place too. And cause me to feel waves of remorse and rejection. In the darkest times of your life, in the darkest times of my life, God is still God. And whether we can in that moment believe it or not or feel it or not, oh, he's still good. And nothing can take away the salvation he gives. Nothing. The Bible says, No one can pluck you from the hand of God once you've been saved and redeemed by him. Now let's think happier thoughts for just a moment. Who in here likes the beach? Anybody? Got some beach lovers in here? 
Awesome. So I grew up in southeastern Kentucky, and the only beach I'd been to for most of my life was the beach of Martins Fork Lake down in Harlan County, Kentucky. And it was pretty cool. But I remember that one time, me and some extended family, a group of about eight or nine of us, made the long drive to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And I'll never forget it. The ocean, the whole experience, it was awesome. And what I didn't really know about the the ocean on the Atlantic coast was how the waves are so crazy. And I remember the thing that we would do for hours and hours and hours is wade out pretty far and let the waves just kind of pick you up and set you down. And we would jump waves over and over for just hours and hours and hours. And I loved it. And sometimes they'd be a little bit crazy. And I remember my cousin who was with us ended up buying or renting one of those boogie boards. And we learned how to ride a wave in. It was great. Now, fast forward to many years later as a married adult. I can't remember which year this was. But we eventually found ourselves in kind of a Gulf Coast situation. And I was like, this water is boring. It's blue, but it's just sitting there, you know. It's like, what what are we going to jump over a wave, you know. It was almost disappointing to experience that. Now that I'm in my 50s, bring that on all day long. I love that kind of water. When I think about the song, It Is Well, that Horatio Spafford wrote, the one phrase that I resonate with the most is the phrase, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Because I think about Myrtle Beach a little bit, and I actually kind of like it, but there have been a few times where the waves were coming in so high and so hard that it would literally knock me down under the water. I can actually hit the bottom. And then I get back up out of the water and get that salt water out of my nose, out of my eyes, and before I can even clear my vision, I'm down again, another wave, knocking me down. Have you ever had that experience at the beach? After about the fourth or fifth wave, you were just walking out back onto the beach, looked like you've been shipwrecked for a week or something, you know? On the one hand, that's fun, but that can happen in real life. And you might be in this room today, you might be watching, listening online today, and you're like, that is me, man. I'm just starting to recover from one wave of sorrow and I get knocked down by another wave. And just when I think I'm about to stand back up on my feet again, I'm getting hit with another and another. And I'm in my early 50s and Sherry and I had this conversation. I hope I'm a wrong predictor here, but we've had sorrows. But I actually have a feeling that as long as I'm breathing God's good air years longer, my hardest sorrows are probably yet to come. And I hope that when they do, that I will also be able to say, it is well. And I've sat in hospital rooms. I've stood in lines at funeral homes with some of you in this very room. And I know what you've endured. And I know the waves that have crashed over in your life. And I just want you to know that it is in that moment that no matter what we go through in life, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And if you've placed your faith in him, nothing, no circumstance, no sorrow, No hardship that you'll ever experience on this side of eternity will absolutely ever take away your salvation. That is firm. That is eternal. That is permanent. And that is why I offer this next step, this action step to you. When the waves of life circumstances come crashing in, remember the unshakable salvation God has given you. Remember it. It's unshakable. Nothing can take it away. But I ask of you in this very room this morning, do you have that? Have you had a moment in your life 
where you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, save me. I need you. I surrender my life to you. Please forgive me of my sins and come into my life today. Friends, I'm telling you, it's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And no matter what you go through for the rest of your days on, the, on this earth, that anchor holds. It always holds. Because it isn't us. It's not dependent on our ability to fix it, understand it, make sense of it. It's just trusting in the only one who can save us. If you've never done that, I invite you to call upon his name right here, right now, as I pray. Will you bow with me? Father, I come before you and I thank you for reminding us of this great salvation. As the author of it as well said, you take not just part of our sin, but all of our sin, and you nail it to the cross so that we don't have to bear it anymore. And Father, there might be someone here who has never asked you to do that. They've never trusted in you in the work of the cross that you have taken care of for us. So as they pray to you right now and ask you to save them and forgive them, help them to know even now that you hear their prayers and that they are now saved, they are yours forever, and that no one could ever pluck them out of your hand. And that no matter what life brings their way from this day forward, your great salvation is unshakable. And that no matter what life waves crash over us, we're okay. You've still got us. And Father, in this room, there are many here who've already placed their faith in you some decades ago. But oh God, they're going through something hard. And maybe they feel like the waves that have been crashing over them and over them and over them over and over again are cruel and they don't make sense. So Father, today we come before you and ask you to help us to be able to say to you here and now, it is well with our souls. Not because of anything we've done, but because you are still God, you are still good, and nothing can take away our salvation. Father, thank you for this truth today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.